E D. E yeah, it's not Ed. It's E D. Okay, E D. I don't care what you think, but it's okay. I'm gonna call it Ed the whole time. Cause I'm not trying to say two syllables here. I'm just trying to say Ed. And there yeah, was what? one before Ed. Yeah. And it's Q E D. So is that one Q E D or is it Ked? Maybe that's why it's E D, is because it doesn't really follow Q E D very well unless you I don't know. I don't like, I don't either. Ked but I mean, doesn't, I've... doesn't sound good. I have to. I have to go. No, I have to go full force, man. I have to. If I'm gonna call it Ed, I have to call it Ked. <laughs> I, I will say Q E D the first time. Coming up in this episode, uh, Ubuntu desktop, but better. Ah, it's fresh anyway. Uh, a short history of Ed. The missing thoughts on Ubuntu, a sip of coffee, and an app that soars loudly. Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 3 of Linux User Space. I'm Dan. And I'm Leo. Hey Leo, I know you're a fan of Linux Mint. And you've got that new framework laptop that you've been testing, I think, everything that, that comes out new everywhere. So far. Have you been, uh, did you install the new beta of uh, Linux Mint Cinnamon? Of course. Of nice. course. Nice, nice. So I got, um, I did get rid of Ubuntu to make room for Linux Mint. There's only room for one Ubuntu on a disk. Well, so, that's fair. That's fair. But I did want to do my part because um, I, I I sing its praises a lot. I did want to do my part uh, for beta testing mm -hmm. on twenty one. But so far, I don't have any complaints. That's um that's pretty rare for a beta. I know they're there. I know other people are having issues, but I mean, generally, my my use case, not so much. So I'm I'm pretty happy with it so far. That's nice. That's nice. It's a, it sounds like it's going to be a solid release. And yeah. and Mint is very conservative though with always, uh with always. like revamping anything. We got a uh, a mutter rebase. I can't remember the version numbers now, but it was on a pretty ancient That's a big jump though. I think it went from like 32 something up to 330 something. Yeah. 338 right. probably, right? Last last 33 release of of mutter. Um so that's a big jump. And seismic yeah yeah it, it's probably gonna put them on the cusp of things like Whalen, and they're they're not there yet Whalen support's not there for cinnamon so don't go you know try slapping it on a Whalen session or something <laughs> like that it doesn't right. work <laughs> of course not yeah mutter is a big piece of that it is it is i think they'll need to do a little more work on mutter before it'll be Wayland ready and anything sitting on top of it will be Wayland ready and by the way when they rebase they rename it too it's called muffin muffin underneath yeah, right but they'll need to do some more work on muffin before we can get to Whalen. but that wasn't going to be for this cycle anyway um but that rebase is what took a huge chunk of development time which is why if you look historically the uh, uh the versions of linux mint the major versions are released before now but yeah a lot of work in the background so it took a little longer and they threw out the Bluetooth stack, too, apparently. Yeah, and they, they went with, like, a, will call it a standard option, which is Blue Man. Blue Man is very popular, and it works quite well, honestly, for um, a standalone Bluetooth connection tool, I think. Uh, I um, like it. I saw it in uh, Ubuntu Mate, maybe 2004 or something like that. And it did seem very simple. I think... I mean, it's on par with any other Bluetooth thing, you know, right click and remove it, uh, click plus and you add it. I mean, it's, it's all, if you know how to connect to Bluetooth stuff, I don't think you'll have any issue, you know, right. making that switch. Um, animations are improved. That's nice. Uh, so I mean, for the same, the same complaint I have 
about uh, older Ubuntu's being kind of choppy, you know, minimizing or doing big animation things. Cinnamon had the same uh, basic mm -hmm. issues. And now, uh, without triple buffering, which is what you uh, Ubuntu got, um, we are getting better, crisper, nicer animations. And Windows look a little bit better as they've uh, they've added some GTK stuff that allowed them to just make things look a bit nicer, which is kind of nice. Yeah, and then of that's course cool. you get all the underlying Ubuntu stuff too. So no. most of uh, all the improvements that you get for Ubuntu, you also get in Linux Mint, which is really really nice. The other thing that's kind of getting me is I've been on Fedora a lot. Uh, I do follow Ubuntu a lot, and now pretty much everybody's on Wayland. All the all the big players are on Wayland, uh, which means you can do really nice touch three, four, twelve finger gestures, right? Uh, Cinnamon still being on Xorg, not so much. You've mm. got to bring in uh, Jose Exposito's uh, touch egg. At, well, it's not touch egg, is it? It's touch egg. Touche GG, I think. I call and it Tusheg. Tusheg? Tusheg. It looks like touch egg to me. It does, but it's got the little accent thing right on the E, so I don't know. That, well, that, that just means to me it's touch egg. That's what it means. <laughs> Gotta add the emphasis. Gotta add the I emphasis on the eh. <laughs> I don't know. It's spelled more like touche, so that's, that's You're right. right. Well, I don't and, know. I mean... To that, you're, you're right. Uh, I assume you're right because the graphical app that goes along with that to change what you know the swipes and all that do, it's called Touche. So you're right. It's Touche G or Touche GG. I, I don't know the GG part, but it's Touche something. Um, yeah, so you still have to add that in Linux Mint, but it's, uh, it's in the repository and Touche is in Flathub. So in Mint... You don't got to do anything other than just search it in the right. software center. So it's all there. Uh, and that's nice. And and that that brings in, I think, everything that I was missing from a Wayland session back to an Xorg session, which... Well, that's, that's not so bad. That's one application. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very much so. And I mean, I've got my three finger swipes going from works. To, I, I didn't have to change anything. I, once it was configured that three finger left and three finger right um, to do the workstation thing, it all just kind of fell into place and then like uh the three finger up is show me all the windows right. three finger down oh. i forget what i set three finger down to maybe that's like i may oh i think that's workspaces show me all the workspaces all oh, the workspaces oh nice. something like that yeah anyway but it was super easy to set up so uh jose thank you uh for putting all that together mm -hmm. because yeah. it's keeping me sane in an xorg world yeah i'm very popular and it's cool that it's a flat pack so that's that's easy portable everybody can install um also a quick uh i don't know i guess amendment to our previous announcement about the lubuntu backports uh th we had the staging stuff and everybody was testing that we've been through testing and now that has gone live so that's available Ooh. on 2204 you can get the latest lxq uh desktop environment on that, so um, I really want to make a, a a shout out to a new Lubuntu contributor, Aaron Rainbolt. Aaron um, did most of the, maybe all of the packaging work. I don't know, like a, a a really big share of the packaging work, and he's been working with another one of our developers, Simon Quigley. In addition to Lubuntu. They've been also bringing this stuff to Debian. So Debian is our upstream and they're, they're contributing there because the, the main maintainer for Debian has kind of stepped away and there's a big gap in the, the version that is available over there. So I think this, uh, this is very needed and people will be super appreciative helping Big Deb and, uh, you know, downstream in Ubuntu. So that's it's really huge. cool. That's a lot of work to be done. And it, it got uh, done. It did. And Aaron's done a fantastic job. Not really done any packaging before this, you know, last few months. And he's really picked up very well. Um, super impressive. So uh, thanks to him. And uh, I'm all the, you know, LXQ in both. Debian and Ubuntu 
users thank him as well. Speaking of Ubuntu, you know, we've been testing, you know, 2204 the LTS all along, you know, last mm-hmm. month and well, several months before. But uh big big deal is the uh, point release, which is coming up. And that'll have that's a fresh set of ISOs that that get rolled out that has all of the uh, updates rolled into it. This is also where anybody that had 2004 will now see the prompt um, to update to 2204. Ah, that's the big change for dot one. Besides, besides rolling all the cool stuff into it into the installer disk, uh, yeah. This is when we get everybody else on board. Yeah. So previously, if you were on um, the interim release, you got the the notification that you could update. But now if you were on the LTS track, now you'll get that update now, too. Right. Because uh, if you were on the interim release, that would have expired. It would have expired. Yep. And so you you would have already gotten the the notification a while back. Um, So this is uh, this is bringing everybody else into the fold. Yeah. So if you were on twenty one ten. Uh, this is last call. <laughs> Get out well, 2204, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're not there by now, well, I mean, like that expired, uh, what, a week ago, a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. We, we announced it. So, um, yeah, get get there soon. And uh, by the way, this is, uh, so if you're hearing this on release day, this point one, as long as everything works out, you should be seeing uh, the dot one release in two days. If you're not listening to this on release day, uh, you're living in the future, man, and uh, you're probably already seeing dot one. If you haven't subbed on YouTube, go do it now. I ha- I'm distracting you right now. now. So go go do it. Go click on that thing. And uh, mm. don't forget, you can watch us live on Twitch the day after an episode drops. So if you see on your phone, hey, the new, new Linux user space is out um, tomorrow is the day we do a live stream. So go check us out there. Come hang out. That's one of the coolest things about the live stream is that mm-hmm. anybody, anybody can join, have a chat, and uh, we'll just talk about Linux stuff pretty much the whole time. So if you don't have enough Linux in your life, go join yeah, that. Yeah, come here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you like what we're doing on the show, on the live stream, and the chats, and the discords, and the telegrams, and the everything else, um, support us at patreon.com slash Linux user space. Uh, first up in the show for topics, uh, we're going to do a little short series, I hope. I hope this is a series of it's things. Gonna, no, it's going to blow up, and we're going to end up having to do 20 of these. It's going to span into season four, <sighs> and we're going to be like, I don't know how to stop this. Yeah, no, there could be a lot. Like, there's a lot of potential here, but I think we're going to keep it short. We're only going to hit a few, few of the highlights, and then you know everything else is based on that anyway. So, yeah, this um, is not going to be an Ubuntu history episode. Uh, no, I, I refuse. No, I, I also <laughs> refuse. But this is the first of the series on text editors. So we thought we would name the segment something. So this and all future text editor history segments will be called text ed first let's let's talk about ed or ed um ed. it's ed it's I, definitely I, i'm ed. gonna call it ed from here on out i'm yeah technically it is e d so if i say ed i'm talking about ed just yeah. just so you know so where we got that from was the gnu ed page um so I, I, I'm just going to describe from their. I'm, I'm going to read their description of Ed. GNU Ed is a line oriented text editor. It is used to create, display, modify, and otherwise manipulate text files, both interactively and via shell scripts. A restricted version of Ed, or Red, can only edit files in the current directory and cannot execute shell commands. Ed is the standard, in quotes, text editor in the sense that it is the original editor for Unix and thus widely available. For most purposes, however, it is superseded by full screen editors such as GNU Emacs or GNU Mo. I want to set the scene. 
So if you rewind a little bit back to the late 60s when text yeah. editors were just getting started. I think one of the I think uh QED started in like 62 or something like that, but as this, as more and this more is folks This before Linux. This is really yes. far back. Right. This is at the the birth of Unix around that time. Late 60s. Uh Peter H Salas, an author of uh or the author of A Quarter Century of Unix and Casting the Net called Ed the most user hostile editor ever created. Uh, and one of the reasons was because the question mark symbol is used for way too many things for quitting, uh, also for errors. And there was no, like, if you got an error, you got a question mark and no error message. It just said, huh? So, <laughs> you know, um, and and you got to keep in mind, right, like this is before monitors were a big, like monitors as we know them today are a big sure. thing. Even even the monochrome monitors before oh, yeah. that, you had teletyped prompts and they weren't monitors. I mean, they, they would they would print things like, like for yeah. real. <laughs> yeah, printing, actual printing. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, and the terseness of prompts, right, I mean, them being super short uh, is really a feature and not a bug at this time right now now it's the reverse because we have monitors and they can auto refresh and update and stuff and not having a very descriptive error message is a sign of a bad software it was the reverse back then because you had a whole you know three bytes to do stuff in the the jokes for vi mm -hmm. uh they work they work for ed as well um, you know, the, how do you, how do I, I've, I've opened VI, I'm in VI or Vim. How do I exit? Mm -hmm. the, the answer is like, what, uh, ZZ, is that the one? And then. Z yeah. Shift. Yeah. The capital ZZ will, will get you out or, yeah. you know, you can, you can colon, um, colon Q, Q exclamation point. If yeah. you, if, if you, if you did edits, then you want to do exclamation point. If you don't want to save, if you want to write right. that, then you want to WQ. Right, right, and and Ed's Ed's functions are similarly opaque. So <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So I mean, if you start Ed with a file name in mind already, and this is on more modern machines, I don't know if it behaved this way back in the day, but uh, the very first thing that it gives you is like the output of standard error, which uh, says that it can't find the file that you're referencing. Right. But it is indeed editing a file named that, so you just have to save it. And then the file will then exist. And anyway, opaque is is the word. Ma manual is needed e for your it, first few goes. Right. And then if you want to add anything, a lot like Vim, you have to uh, do I and then enter for insert mode or E and then enter for edit mode or C and then enter for change mode. Don't ask me what the difference is between any of them. But you had to press enter after each of those, and then it put you into the mode. Right. And then to exit that mode, you do a dot and then enter. And then you're back into like command-based mode and not, you know, I'm, I'm adding this to the text file right. mode. And then once you were in that mode, you could hit W and enter to write it, and then Q and enter to quit it. And all along the way, you're getting this question mark and you don't yeah. know if it's an error or not. You have no idea. If it, it could hope, be an error. It might hope, be an error even. You hope it's doing the right thing. You hope. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and so, like, when you're doing any of these things, remember, this is a line editor. This mm -hmm. is not a full screen editor. You're not doing the entire document all at once. Right. It, it's essentially interactive as you, like, line it, by line by line. It, Inter interactive by line, yeah. Yes, there, there was a, uh, there is a, uh, like a command for what is essentially like hitting enter in the text file, right, to go down to the new line. You had to use in for new lines. New line, yeah. Mm -hmm. To specify that you wanted new lines, right? So, I mean, this this is in a far and away magical place that, <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't understand for the most part anymore. You just don't have this kind of interaction with computers anymore. Right. 
So yeah, like Leo says, it, it requires a man page to simply get the hello world going. You do. Yeah. You have to. What, what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. So much of Ed came from uh, QED, or Quick Editor. Or which was Ked. I'm just going to call it Ked. It might be Ked. <laughs> it's I not. don't know. It's not. It's no. <laughs> um, which was released in 1967. So that was like the predecessor, if you will. Um, of even, you know, what we have now, um, it was one of the f first three key elements of the Unix operating system. So you had an assembler, an editor, and a shell that those are the three elements that you needed to, to make the Unix operating system. So this was developed by Ken Thompson in August, 1969. Uh, Thompson was quite the pioneer in the computer science field, have to say. And together with Dennis Ritchie, they created Unix. I mean, I guess together. I mean, there was yeah. probably, uh, there was other people too involved, but they were the primary people that were, were creating this stuff. Um, and if something didn't exist in the early days, you had to write it. Thompson did that like several times over throughout the, course of his career he wrote b which was the precursor to c language um, and we still can't get rid of it we still can't everybody wants to google just came out with carbon yeah i mean really c you're gonna name c it the most generic thing in the whole world so not even google can google carbon nice yeah. nice one google um and so c is you know very ubiquitous at this point still very much so. And in fact, he used C to write Ed. So Ed is written in C. In addition to that, he's also more recently a co-developer for the Go language. And so if you were wondering why I was taking shots at Google, yeah, that's it. This is yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And so um, there it is. Like So those are some big things. He also wrote several other text-based tools, things like grep, dd, uh, unique, among others, that are still very popular in current times for Unix and Linux administration. I, li I like that you picked those three examples because I still use those three examples all the time. I know, and, and you're not alone because they are very, very, very popular for administrators yes. um yeah i i don't i don't if you're a serious uh linux admin you're probably you're probably y you need to know those yeah just do um so the initial release of ed was in 1973 which is interesting because it was after you know after he'd kind of wrote it or developed on it um it got released in 1973 uh, official, officially released. I, right, I think, yeah. I, I'm sure they were using it on the back end quite a bit. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Even though monitors that would refresh on their own were more common in the 70s, AT&T happily used Tektronix 4014s, which meant interactive text wasn't going to happen in Ed. So the, the reason I put this in there is because the Tektronix 4014s they they weren't auto refreshing on the screen like you had to request a refresh on the screen so um the interactive text editing that we expect today is you know you type a letter you see a letter you type a letter you see a letter well that's not how it worked back then and because AT AT&T spent lots of money <laughs> getting these monitors in front of their employees that just meant that the people that worked on Ed who were employees of AT&T didn't care about that auto refreshing auto updating and that ended up falling to the successors of Ed like VI and Emacs which were both released in 1976 and others obviously there's more than just those two right. uh, but surprisingly some of Ed's code live lives on oh, in for sure in all of these projects. So Ed was the seed that VI grew from. And Emacs, not trying to start a war yet. Yet. 
<laughs> we'll get there, though. <laughs> so also, in addition to that, uh, the early MUDs, or multi-user dungeons, uh, from the 70s and 80s would also use an Ed-like syntax. Yeah, so I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine having to remember lots of key combinations not combinations i guess like like just what each key does to remember how to play a game but you know i guess it's not that different well and and so because it's not as interactive like knowing where you are and what you're doing like that's just not being able to keep track of, you have to keep track of it in your head right where, yeah. where you're well, at it's very D and D like D- Dungeons and right. Dragons. You you have to know where you are in the game and know <laughs> how you can move, where other things are. It's very imagination based, and so were muds. Uh, you you really did have to keep track. I mean, or just write down notes, which is also what you do in Dungeons and Dragons, right? Well, I mean, for sure, yeah, absolutely. You got to remember somehow, and you can't keep it all in that noggin of yours. So writing it down was a huge help. So I suppose you probably had written down all of the keystrokes that you needed to know to be able to move around and do stuff. So, yeah, very interesting stuff. 1980, uh, a re-implementation of Ed is called Edlin. I'm, I'm going to call it that. See, uh, now here's why I, <laughs> why I think it's Ed, because I don't think you call you would you would like say Edlin as. E D Lin or E D L I N, but maybe you did. Maybe you did, and I'm just the one guy that just refuses to stop calling it Ed. So, I, I you know, it's it's short for Edit Line, right? Um, so, yeah, right. But that that's made for 86 DOS, also known as Q DOS or uh, Quick and Dirty OS. You know, that's when that was born in the 1980. Uh, at the end of 1980 in December, Microsoft purchased a non-exclusive license to 86 DOS. Then, in July of 1981, purchased everything outright. Edlin was included from version 1.0 to version 5.0 in MS DOS. Yeah, I think I think the MS DOS versioning stopped at six ish, something yep. like that. So yep. in the in the most later in in the in the latest versions of DOS, you no longer get Edlin, and it's a uh, hmm, hmm, they left it behind. That's a still a long history, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Ed itself is still kind of in use, right? If you think of VI and Emacs as the 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 real successors, even code oh, included sure. uh, to Ed. But yeah, when whenever 5.0 was released, uh I should probably should have looked that up. Um that's that's the last time I guess the direct successor of Ed was was really used that I could find. I want to say that was late 80s early 90s ish. Um when when that was available. Um I do remember 6 and that was like a big difference. Um so and that, and you know like Windows was out at you know 3 one was out by then right. too. So that was also why there was a big jump in things. You can still try Ed today. You can. On your Linux machine. Uh just about any Linux machine, actually. Uh Ubuntu 2204 definitely has it. And I checked on my Endeavor OS install, which we're trying out for the month. Um that also has it. So Arch and I'm sure just about every other distribution as well. Pretty much. Yep, uh, I did. So as we started digging into to, to Ed and, you know, where it started and everything, that was one of the very first things that I wanted to do was, well, can I try it? How yeah, bad wanna... could it possibly be, right? Like, it's got to be super simple. You can't add a whole lot to it. We're talking the, the whole program's got to be like, I mean, a kilobyte or something, right? I mean, it, it cannot be large. Where it's storage, tiny. yeah, storage <laughs> was non-existent back then for for yep. the for the majority of stuff. So, and it is. I mean, it's very simple. There's really not a whole lot to it. You do have to remember individual letter commands, but very much like you do in VI and Vim today. So it's not really that far removed. The the big difference. Right. Is that VI and Vim, you can do multiple lines. You can go, you know, from top to the bottom of a document right. easily. You can 
kind of do that in Ed, but it's way more difficult and it's very command line driven. Uh, well, command driven. And right. uh, the hardest part is like deleting stuff um, or replacing stuff. You pretty much just have to understand how said works. Which is is also one of those tools that, you know, kind of was born from the actual editor, right? So Right, yeah. right. And we use it again. We we use said a lot yep. today, mm -hmm. and it had its birth around this time as well. The, a big takeaway, though, here is that regular expressions, um, they were very popular then. Yes. And if you didn't, you didn't know how to work with regular expressions back then um you were not efficient and that's still somewhat true today i will say right um, yeah I, I think so i mean you, you have to at least be able to sort of demystify the simple regex to just get around there's so much regex all over the place just you mm -hmm. know cutting things down or making it nice that efficient you, you i'll call to. it efficient yeah 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 so yeah that's that's a takeaway uh, it's it's amazing to me the fundamentals that um, came out of those early pioneer days still hold true. And I will say, um, I did I did some digging while we were talking, and Ed Edlin would have died between June of nineteen ninety one and March of nineteen ninety three okay. when Microsoft would have released MS DOS six all right, so I wasn't too far off. I was a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Edlin made it to the early '90s. It 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 reached into a whole another decade before it was interesting. And one last little thing that I'll add here is, Leo, you found this video uh, by Tech Tinkering um, that shows the proper use of Ed if you don't want to go try it out for yourself and read the man page that's you can, that's you can, the thing you can watch this yeah yeah because it took me just a little while i mean it took me i don't know it probably took me about 20 30 minutes to really kind of get my bearings in ed <laughs> so that i could save a line properly right and and start a new line to add to the existing like because I, I was i was going back and forth and i'm like why didn't it save my stuff well, i didn't type it right because I wasn't in insert mode, so it was never mm -hmm. actually taken. Yeah, so as as much <sighs> as I hated learning VI, um, at least Ed you got a little is... feedback there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like big red in the bottom and stuff. Um, <laughs> so yeah, huh, huh. Anyway, that tech tinkering video shows you what I suspect pretty much everybody was doing back in the seventies when they were using Ed. So go check that out. That one's actually kind of nice. Um, and it yeah gives you gives you what you need to know. Well, I mean, all of that was much more efficient than the actual you know the alternative, which was having a deck of cards that you stuffed into a machine. <laughs> so you know you want to edit something, you change the card, right? The, yeah, exactly. That, you didn't have those functions, so you were this, yeah this, you were punching. This was were, this was ooh. nice. This was really nice. So you want to have a topic covered? Have some feedback. You can send us an email. You can use the uh, fireside little contact form mm -hmm. on linuxuserspace.show, or you can email us directly at contact at linuxuserspace.show. All right, Leo, we <laughs> went way over time last time on Woo! Ubuntu, and I don't know that we got all of our thoughts about Ubuntu and 2204 LTS. So, oh, we did not. That that little ending segment was like five minutes, and I had way more to say about it. But yeah, I knew no, I knew we just weren't going to fit it, so I didn't even bother. Yeah, so we carved out a little bit of time here in this episode, and one thing that we did not talk about was if we kept it or not. Oh, that is true. The moment of truth. And, so and, and so I did, Leo. What? I don't believe no, it. Gnome, I kept it. I don't believe it. You're a QT guy from top to bottom. I don't believe I, it. I am, but I did. And it's been wow. pretty great. Really? No, I'm I'm there's some features there that, that are kind of great and it does get out of your way. Yeah, it does do that. Honestly, there's I I like plasma, but one thing that uh I think might be done better is the overview stuff. 
Oh. So overview of workspaces and overview of applications that are running. I don't know. They just, that always really impresses me. And um, I guess the way the super key can kind of interact with all of that, that's one of the things I really like about No. And I yeah. wish I wish could carry over everywhere. Yeah, I, I think you can you can kind of hack you it together. You can do some of that stuff. On you plasma. can do it. You can totally do it in plasma. And you can have like hot corners and stuff like that too, which I also like. Um so I mean, yes, you can do a lot of that stuff. Um but I think it's just done really well in Gnome. I think it I, I think it is too. I think that is one of the biggest reasons that GNOME in general is slowly starting to win me over. If you listen to the top of the show, you know it's not there yet, mm -hmm. but there are just some things about GNOME that over the past, what, decade since GNOME 3 well, and now 4 has been out? Uh, it took that long, but I'm uh, yeah. coming around. I'm coming around. I think it's better than it once was, and so, you know, I'm giving it a go for a little while anyway, it, it, alongside Endeavor, because we're testing Endeavor, so... Yes, we I, are. I installed it alongside, so I have both on, on the laptop, so um, they're both there, so I decided to keep it. Yeah, okay, so to... Before I get into my spiel, uh, I did too. It is on my T450S. Um... I, I did have to make room on my framework so it's no longer there. Mm -hmm. But on my T450S, I think I think it's just going to stay there. I don't know that I'm going to remove it off of that machine. It is good. It is very, very, very good. Nice. Nice. That's that's I think that's some high praise. We test a lot of things. So the fact that one of them sticks around for a little while... I think that's impressive. Well, I I mean, you got to give them credit. I mean, Ubuntu is probably the biggest distro if you look at derivatives. Yep. There are so many Ubuntu derivatives that have gotten popular as opposed to... There are a lot of derivatives of a lot of different distros, but I think Ubuntu's derivatives, including their flavors, right, right, have have gotten huge popularity. That's true. So you got you can't fault them for that. They 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 do make an exceptionally good base system. But again, standing on the shoulders of giants, let's not forget. Well, for sure, Debian here, right, uh, which is where the majority of all of this comes from. It is. And uh, that's, I mean, you know, that's the upstream and a lot of uh, Ubuntu developers are Debian developers as well. And yeah. So that's the yeah. reason that stuff gets put in there. And if you remember your history, so was Mark Shuttleworth. So it, would, right. it, it, it made sense. It made sense. It's a very symbiotic relationship, I'll call it. And so it is. It is this huge cycle of life that just keeps turning and turning and turning until you end up with more polished um defaults i guess we could say when it, it comes to ubuntu and its derivatives yeah and and well i mean obviously they'll throw in a few proprietary bits too well of course which, which, which you know debian's a little more free if you will from the the libre you know and 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 open standards whereas ubuntu is going to make things a little easier and give you some of those well, I have, you know, like video codecs and stuff like that, right? Just check the box. Just check the box. So, I mean, I guess it fills a niche there, too. So It definitely does. So, oh. I, I, before we get too far, like, obviously, Snap is, is a technology that uh, Canonical is, is promoting. And I fully think they should. That's their technology. That's mm -hmm. their thing. It should be there. Why would you have not have it built in? Well, it's it, front it, and center. Keep it that way. I I don't fault I mean, them for that at all. Yeah, I mean that's that's part of a business, if you will. Uh, promote your own product, eat your own dog food. So that's there. Although me personally, I don't use it a lot. I use a lot of flat packs because I don't know. They just they just work for me. Well, but, again, in the history, right? Like the first time that Snap was really kind of debuted, it was debuted to be the backbone of mm -hmm. IoT stuff. That's true. Well, 
Well, I take that. I take that back. And the phone stuff. And the phone stuff too. Yeah, exactly. But that that started with clicks and kind of morphed into Snappy and then Snap yep. and then right. So there 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 is a lot of lineage there, and the focus was not the gnome calculator. It it right. <laughs> it, it started to take that on as we realized we could use it for that kind of thing, but. By and large, it was for phone applications, and it was right. for the command line. And at at least at the command line, it excels at that. Snap is one of I, my favorite command line runner utility Docker style type things. That, yeah, it's, it's not amazing. it's not container re too much, but like it, it does make things much easier, and I fully support that personally and i think it's coming a long way for desktop applications too it's nice that it's there by default it gives you access to a lot of software and that's easy for people to use it's just i don't but even here's the point i really want to make is even though flat packs are not the primary focus they work very well Oh, it's like, super easy to install. It, it, it's it, even got a little plugin thing for the the software. Software, and so thing. they they will update themselves. Whereas in GNOME software, whereas like anywhere else, Flatpaks don't do that. You have to go yeah. tell it to update, and so um, I think that's that's those like I know that's GNOME, you know, pushing that stuff, but it's not stripped away. They could have done that, right? Totally could have done that. Said no, you need to use Snap. Snap is our right. technology. Yeah, you're you're not going to use flat packs here, um, but they didn't. So, and the fact that they kept it simple is good. I I I I think. Yeah, Snap is front and center, obviously as it should be. But flat pack can be made a first class citizen, and mm -hmm. I think that is the biggest thing that matters because. I had a couple of things, right? I mentioned Touche at the top of the show, mm -hmm. which doesn't exist in Snapcraft. So if you want it, you either have to compile it yourself or get it from Flatpak, or there's, I'm sure there's an alternative way to get it. But yep. I mean, I, I just found it easier to just install the Flatpak and use it. It was way easier that way. And the audio player I talked about at the uh, in the very first episode, Amberall. Amberall, yeah. That again is another, but it's a it's a GNOME app, mm -hmm. and GNOME apps are usually always published first to Flat Hub, mm -hmm. and then you know they make their way into repositories and things like that. I'm sure it's in the Arch repository. I didn't check on Endeavor OS, but I, I'm sure I will. Um, oh, I bet. But it again, is. if it's not, another it's in one, the AUR, right? Like everything, it's in one place or the other. Right, and it's not the only app that is not a Snap, but is a flat pack. So if you're right. If you're very close to the GNOME ecosystem and you're going to be using a whole lot of GNOME software that isn't bundled in by default on Ubuntu, you're going to need to add Flatpak. That is, you just don't have an option. Those, those things are not easily accessible most other places in the Ubuntu ecosystem. Um, so yeah, that, that was... As I was using Ubuntu, I found out uh, pretty quickly that there was just some software you couldn't get. And that's okay, because, I mean, I'm, I'm a fairly technical person, so I don't care if I have to shove flat right. back in there and make it work. That's fine. Um, but speaking of snaps, the Firefox snap, I've got good news. Uh, yeah, no, actually, yes. I'll agree with this. Very much so. Very good news. So in April, when we first started installing Ubuntu, because we just figured, you know, use it the whole break. We did. Um, I got it on both my T450S, where it still lives, and I have it on my framework, or had it on my framework, where it no longer lives. But Firefox took a good chunk of time on that cold start. And if you remember, yeah. I reboot a lot because either dual booting purposes or sleep is not great on the two machines that I have. So I reboot a lot. And that means that I saw cold start times a lot, which brought me to the point where I just got to record it. I got to know how long it's going to take. So on my T450S, and we're talking the original version of Firefox that was shipped, which was still in the 90s, I think, uh, took about 11 seconds on my T450S, which has a fifth gen i5, 
and 12 seconds on my framework, which had an 11th gen i7. That doesn't even make any sense. No, that's newer. It took longer. And I used that extension, the the one, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's the extension that you can add that times everything when it starts up. So I got, I mean, it was like four digits of milliseconds. So I knew how long this was taking, you know, down to the wow. uh, one gajillionth of a second. I don't know what it is, right? But uh, about about 12 seconds on each machine. In July... This latest, uh, up to Firefox 102, I believe. Yeah, 102, yeah. Was when we saw this market increase of startup time. On cold boot, seven seconds on my T450S, six seconds on the framework. That makes a little more sense because the framework has more horsepower. But um, that's almost a 50% increase in both cases. Yeah, I, I don't think those are honestly terrible times because I think if you compare it to the native applications, you know, they can be upwards of that time too. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, like uh, maybe maybe you're like a couple of seconds off, honestly, which is still pretty close. Oh, right. And you're, these are not scientific numbers. So, you know, right. take, take them all with a grain of salt. But I mean, approximately a 50% increase in speed is while not scientific still fantastic yeah yeah that's huge um a couple of different i can point to a couple of different technical things if you're interested always one of them is the compression algorithms used right so they've been mm -hmm. been fiddling with those to 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 make improvements there the other thing they did was like compiling different ways you know and and compile flags that get up applied to these things as um as they progress like i mean so software coming out of the gate is obviously not going to be as optimized as something that you know you you keep adjusting so mm -hmm. naturally the first iterations of this even though they were around for a little while right they hadn't been quite optimized yet and so right. they keep making some adjustments and uh a lot of improvements, and I, th I, I think you'll continue to see improvements, which is yeah. why I don't think we they should abandon snaps personally. Oh because, no, um, and even for the desktop. So keep making improvements, keep pushing it out there, keep making it the first class citizen. It's the product that they produce and promote. So I mean, that's just my thoughts. A lot of people say they should abandon it. It just doesn't work. Oh, no, but I, no. But I disagree with that. No way. Why, we need more avenues to get software, not less. More. Do keep in mind that a lot of the timings that you're going to be seeing on these startup snap thingamajigs are very app dependent. Right. Uh, Bitwarden has not seen the market increase on startup time that has been seen on Firefox. Right. Bitwarden takes about as long as it took for Firefox originally to start up. It takes about 12 seconds, and that's that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, and so, I, you know, without checking, I mean, have they done some of those things that they did with right. Firefox, and, right? And I assume probably they not, haven't. Right? right? They probably have not. Yeah. But the so I, I don't want, you know, this this huge increase in startup time on Firefox to give you the wrong idea about a huge increase across the board. Board, yeah. It's it's very app dependent. So do keep that in mind and don't get too upset when one app takes a good long time to start mm -hmm. up when your Firefox is it's already running. I don't know. So just just keep that in mind. But I think across the board they are getting slightly better iteration over iteration over iteration. So um, it's it's good. I think snaps are gonna are gonna get there. They are. Uh, they flat are. pack. I, they do have a little bit of uh of an increased startup time depending on the app, you know, as opposed to like natively installed, you know, like end user whatever app. Um, but they by and large are much faster. So I, I do tend to default to flat pack a lot for uh for a lot of well, stuff, and that that's one of the reasons. It's the compression. Uh, ultimately, there's still mm. compression. Yes, like exactly. in a snap, right? I mean, that has not gone away. Whereas you look at a flat pack and they're 
kind of large. They're chunky little fellers. Yeah, they, they just splat that stuff right on your disc, man. <laughs> so, I mean, there's the trade-off right there, right? Do you want to do want to consume all the disc or do you want to consume all the CPU? I mean, those those are your, those are your choices and, and yeah. they've gone different directions and I don't know that either one of them is wrong, I guess. Is right? They have their use case. <laughs> exactly. So, not not straying too far from the snap stuff. Uh, I do want to, and I suppose, by, before I even get into this, I suppose this stuff is going to be fixed in the dot one release that's coming out in a couple of days. So I don't think you're going to run into this after you hear this, but it happened on multiple installs, multiple times, and it's kind of weird. So I made uh, I made a few tweets about it. But like the Snap Store trying to update the Snap Store, but mm. the Snap Store can't update the Snap Store while the Snap Store is running trying to update the Snap Store, right? That that whole thing. The Snap Store doesn't install itself, though it should. And it has after the initial update. But here's the deal, right? Like it seems reasonable because a software that needs to update itself has to close itself before it can actually update itself, but it was refusing to. And the only way... Unless you dug in, yes, I could fix this going into the terminal. Took less than thirty seconds to actually fix it on a separate install. So I I know for sure. Yeah. But if you don't know terminal foo, yeah. Or mm -hmm. if you don't have, if you didn't Google it, you didn't care enough. You had to wait fourteen days for the snap to do a force refresh right. on the on the the Ubuntu software store center. Before yeah. it would actually update the first time. And that was just really weird to me. And I couldn't figure out for the life of me why. Why? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's running, right? So it can't shut itself down. I don't know. Like, they didn't have a mechanism for that. I don't so know. The, but the deal was, like, you go to the Ubuntu section or the, the update section and then you, you see just one update left, which is the one that is complaining about the Ubuntu store. Mm-hmm software whatever uh and then you click update like that should be the trigger that should be the one that says all right well obviously he wants me to update only one app and only the, to update this app i must close myself and then relaunch myself and like losing your place and then getting back to the update tab one time ever is a price i'm willing to pay right 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 and i suppose Everybody would be willing to pay that because every day from now until 14 days later, yeah, It'll let it you know. will <laughs> complain at you. Yeah. And the other thing was when you well, opened up the little notification dealio and you clicked on it, nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. Other apps will do that too. I mean, like, so like your Firefox snap, right? If you left it open for 14 days and like an update was due, it'll... It'll complain at you daily on that one, too. Yeah. To be clear, I closed the Ubuntu software thing. I right. rebooted multiple times. This was not a, right. you know, oh, if you just did the right shimmy and shake, oh, it'll right. update right, for right. you. No, it would not. No, it would not. Yeah, I tried. I for yeah. all 14 of those days, I let it run out. I just, I was curious to see if it was going to fix itself or not. And it did fix itself, so... You know, it's not like it's not like this would have been a problem that would have haunted you forever. It did take care of itself, so uh, it's not an egregious thing. But it just made me laugh because every day, every day, it was like, "Hey, eight days left, seven days left. Hey, guess so what? Twenty four hours left." <laughs> <laughs> so that probably is going to be fixed. On the, I haven't gone and researched right. this myself. It and, probably and is fixed. So I am 99% sure it will be fixed on that image because it, it only took one update of the software store, Ubuntu Software Center, for it to just alleviate itself. And I've seen more updates come down for that package, and mm -hmm. I it never had another problem. So And it was a known problem, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, oh, know, it was. But yeah, it was funny. So getting I those rolled out is tough. Yeah, I bring it up mostly because it's funny and not to just trash on Ubuntu. It is. It was hilarious to me because it did a whole thing. Like it was a whole saga of will it be today? It was not today. Not. Will it be today? It was not today. It was the very last day where it forced refreshed and it did take care of itself. But it did make me laugh for 14 days. That was pretty much it. 
like yeah. little things that I know are already solved. But, um, huh, just weird. So I do have to say that Ubuntu, we're going to end on a high note. For sure. I have complained for the longest time that my T450S, without like ripping out every extension possible, does not run well on GNOME. And I would consider an i5 integrated graphics as low to medium performance, right? And I was getting good performance with all the extensions removed on NixOS and Void Linux. If you go back to those history episodes, that's where I talk about that stuff. But finally, GNOME, with their triple buffering support... The triple buffering is nice. Yeah. ...has made it as smooth as Nix and Void, mm -hmm. even if you consider extensions on the T450S, 5th Gen i5, just integrated graphics, and I'd say it's 95% smooth. It very, very few stutters. Even uh, when doing the little three finger swipe up mm -hmm. where all the windows go pow, you know? And that's that that's the sound effect, by the way. When you do that, you should add a sound and it goes pow. Pow. <laughs> anyway, as comparison, right? So I'm I'm running this on a, a older i5 than what you have. It, oh it's it's a, it's a third gen i5, right? Yeah. And and um you're you're right. So those animations, I don't have to turn them off. I can use the animations, yes. and so it, it's nice. It really feels good. It feels smooth. There aren't a lot of stutters. And it works. There are not. It works great on my third gen i5 with eight gig of RAM. Jeez, man. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, it, I, it was much more RAM than that. I can't remember. Sixteen or twenty is weird on right. that particular laptop, but. It was impressive just how much better GNOME performance has gotten iteration over iteration over iteration. And that's the other thing that is helping me warm up to GNOME. When it was stuttery, when it was a stuttery mess in like mm -hmm. 38, 36, ooh, a 3.0, three, three well, whatever it yeah, was. Three they changed the number. Yeah, 3.38, yeah. Yeah. It was terrible. That was mm -hmm. the biggest reason. But now that's taken care of. I like the gestures. I like Wayland. I like all that stuff. So it's coming together. And Ubuntu has has centered themselves on a version and backported the the triple buffering thing to make that even better. And so I think 2204 is going to be just a really good all-around distro that newcomers, you can recommend it to new people. And, yeah. All of that kind of good stuff, and it will just stand the test of time, like most of the LTSs before it. I agree. I agree. Very solid. And you can catch these and other great topics as they unfold on our subreddit or our news channel on Discord. Either or, all the same news on one goes to the other. So we got a link for the subreddit. We got a link for the Discord. And if you so choose, the Telegram and the Matrix as well. Not as much news goes to Telegram and Matrix because we don't want to clutter those places up there. It's harder to compartmentalize in those. But if you want to talk to us, those are the places to do it. All right. We got a little feedback here from Larry. Uh, Larry says, I'm a Mint Mate user, and I've heard all of the controversy about it. My personal feeling is that it was and still is a great distro. It didn't affect me at all. I got to agree. Linux Mint, really nice. And I suppose the controversy may have been the uh, the snap thing mm. and probably mostly the snap thing. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of controversy there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they do put front and center exactly how to install snap. So They do. They give you yeah. a, a method to do it if you want. Yeah. Every release notes has that same tag. So, eh, controversy or not, it, it is a solid thing. Uh, Larry goes on to say, oh, when I started Linux in 2000, I was told that Google was your friend. It simply meant that if you need something to look up, that's what I did. I started using Mint when 5 came out. Before that, I tried everything and used Ubuntu when it first came out. I found all that I need from searches, and it was... Mostly from Mint and 
Ubuntu forums. I believe that we should help everyone as much as we can, but nothing replaces finding yourself what you need. Yeah, yeah fi fi finding the information on your own um, probably helps you learn it better than, you know, regurgitating some commands that somebody spewed out on a forum. Yeah, I think there's a delineation there. I think there are people that care, and mm -hmm. those people are best served by just by looking it up and, you know, verifying with someone that might be more knowledgeable than them. Right. But then you have the other side that, I don't care, man. I just want it to work. I just stop want to get this telling done. Me, stop telling me all this. I don't want to know any of this. Right. What is the command I need to run to make this work yep. right? Give me that. So it's it's it depends. It depends on who you are. But if you care, looking it up for yourself is probably going to be the best thing that you could do because you're going to learn a whole lot learn. more. You're going to remember, yeah. too, a whole lot more about how all this stuff works. It, it lets you know the, the why instead of just the how. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't get the why, that's why you come to like one of the channels that we run or that any mm -hmm. other Linux group runs and chat about it for a little bit. Uh, the many distros are a two edged sword. That's what Linux is all about choice. Many have filled their own desire to make it what they want. That to me just makes it better. I, I said something similar to this earlier. As well, because we were talking about packaging, snap, flat pack, app image, all that kind of stuff, right? The more the merrier. It's great. It's great. But that is, as Larry says, a double-edged sword, because mm -hmm. now you got, you know, 12 different ways to get your packaging, mm -hmm. and oh, which one do I want? And I, I think a lot of times people just use whatever's given to them, right? and they don't worry about it. But um, having all of the options available to you as you become more knowledgeable about how to set these things up and stuff um, can only be a good thing. And then, of course, like distros, the best rise to the top. And then just like right now, you only hear really about Snap and Flatpak and, of course, traditional packaging. Um, and then, yeah. It works that way. Most distros are that way too, where there's just a handful that you hear yep. about a lot, but there are thousands out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there are. <laughs> so Larry closes with, I, I still like the new music and I have no problem with the new format. So Woo! thanks. Yeah, we're trying thanks. we're trying to shorten thanks. it up. Yeah. Oh wait, hold on. Uh, doing yeah, it yeah, against yeah. the camera is weird. I can't do it, man. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. No, but we yes. appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. I'm glad you liked the new music. Uh, it was a very, um, what is the word? Like, I was apprehensive about the change, but yeah, um, I, yeah. I like it well, too. But like, like last minute, uh, Leo says, "Hey, hey, we, what about changing the music?" And and I had a few like, the day before we went to record. Just yeah. so you know, and I had so a, I'm like so I had. I had been Lit thinking about it for a long time, and I was like, I have my reasons for changing it. Yeah, but I get it. Um, but I I kept forgetting to bring it up whenever we would get together, or just dropping it in Discord and asking. And then as we we're coming up to recording time, I'm like, Oh God, I forgot. Well, uh, maybe maybe we can do it. And, and so like I'm like, I think right I can now. listen to a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and what was funny is I had a huge amount. Oh, okay, huge. It was it was like a half dozen or so candidates, mm -hmm. and one of them somebody else was already using. So, well, yeah, that was out. <laughs> thanks, Linux out loud. And <laughs> so I, we were down to five, and Dan out of left field comes out with, "What about this one?" And the moment I played it, I was like, "Ooh, ooh that's pretty like good." This. And then it and then it does this whole uh, psychedelic. Yeah, like uh, progressive changes, rock, yeah. total change of a song, and I'm like, oh, I, I like that, that too. too. Yeah, and then it does it again later on in the song, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's that's, it. that's the intro, that's the outro, those are the bumpers, that's everything. This song is everything to us, and so yeah, we got we got kid approval, we got wife approval, we got yep, yep everybody that gets the behind the scenes got to hear a little bit of this before. Uh, before we we just shoved it in there, and I'm yeah, glad we you got, like it. Now we too. got Larry approval, so there you go. That and seals that's, the deal. That's that's one of the that's one of the approvals I was waiting for, and I'm glad I have it.
yeah, we, we want the listeners to have approval. So that's what it's all about. First up of our focus Ooh. sessions here. Focus yes. number one. Keep keep them focused. I guess it's a podcast or a log. I'm not sure which which thing it is. Isn't it? It's it's all of it. This is Steve's very own YouTube channel. We we I I want to stop you there because I I feel like we got to talk about this part. It was really hard to decide if it was Steve's very own YouTube channel or Steve's very owns YouTube channel. Is it already possessive or do we need to add possession to it? I don't know why it took us on this segue, but it made me laugh earlier. So maybe it did. Maybe well, it made me chuckle with... too. And I <laughs> chuckle at Leo a little bit. I'm not the best at the English language, so I'm really oh. not a subject matter expert here on this. Um, but I'm going to go with Steve's very own YouTube channel. Good call. And so Steve's Sunday Linux Coffee Clatch and his Linux Coffee to Go is what you'll find there every Sunday. It's kind of a lug. Like, it's a great little lug. And it so is. We meet up there on Sunday mornings and it's very laid back. You come, you grab your coffee and we can talk Linux and open source. And well, it, it diverges into other things, too, which is totally fine because it's very relaxed. It it reminds me a lot of our live streams, I think, because like we go mm -hmm. in with a set amount of things, and then all of a sudden we're off the rails. I don't know we what are. we're talking yeah. about anymore. Food or <laughs> something, I don't even know. Yeah, so. I wish, I wish uh, I was more of an early bird so I could catch these live. I do go watch them after the fact, but the participation is kind of like what you want out of something mm -hmm. like that, I think. And so... Yeah, I wish I was more of an early bird so I could go in and, and harass Steve a little bit uh, while uh, while they're going through it. Yeah, I'm sometimes not public ready there. So I'm, you'll find me in the YouTube chat often, more often than you will on a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because like, yeah, I'm just barely getting to the first cup of coffee here. So yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, but I need about it, 12 more. Yeah, it is a great stream and we have a lot of good fun. So do join if you can. And I know in your time zone, it's a little... You know, it's an hour shifted too, so that's mm -hmm. the other thing. So, um, it, it's it's a good time. So he also has the Linux Coffee to Go, which is usually like a little clip that he pulls from the Great Sunday Show, um, and kind of the the things that will impact you probably the most and maybe the most interesting. He'll he'll pull out little clips, and that's the Coffee to Go. All right, Steve, if you're listening. You got Linux coffee to go. That means that the coffee's fast, right? It gets in your hands real fast, like Express. What if it was called Linux Express? Oh, ha ha! <laughs> ah, that made, made <laughs> ah, that's me so laugh. Cute. <laughs> that's made me stuff. laugh. Anyway, but we love we love Steve. He's he's around our our channel as well, and you know Telegram and and great community members. So yep. please go support him. So Steve. Here's to you, a coffee-flavored drink. I just have iced tea. Push them up, folks. It's time to focus for the second for the second time, but yeah. also stay focused. So we're gonna focus on. It's a great app. It's a it is a good app. So obviously, obviously, before I tell you the name of this thing, obviously. Windows and Mac have their own built-in mail clients. But it seems to me, and keep this in mind, I'm excluding Electron apps so this statement can be truer, that there's only one option for a cross-platform native mail client. I think that to be true. And it's Thunderbird. It's Thunderbird, and somehow new life has been breathed in to the mm -hmm. bird you thought was dead. You thought the bird was dead. You were like, mm, I'll just use the webmail. And so did everyone else, uh, including me. I, I, I got a little, uh, you can go back, I can't remember, this is the second season sometime, kind of got a little infatuated, had a little fling with Geary. Yep, and I still yep. love 
Geary. Geary looks pretty. It looks pretty. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Thunderbird's going through a little revamp right now. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. while you can still have the old layout, you can also get a Geary style layout. Mm. That that's that was that was the thing. Yeah, so that's that's what drew us back. Yeah, it it did. So there was a post about version one oh two and that's that's where we're at right now. One oh three, which has the, the big interface changes, is not mm-hmm. here yet. Yep. But one oh two came with a better export migration wizard and Dan. We were talking about mm-hmm. our email woes. We did have a little woe. We yep. kinda we kinda skirted around that a little bit, right? But but uh, the email just wasn't there for a little while. We had to do some uh, backside finagling to make it all work and everything. And when you do that, you lose everything. But we didn't because Thunderbird had it all cached mm-hmm. and I was able to export it. But it was kind of a pain. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't kind of a pain. It was a huge pain to get it in a format that I thought was easy to move around. And so now I have backups of it and everything else. And these are, you know, mails prior to season three. But now, and of course it would be after I needed it. But now, if we ever need it again, there is a much better export, migration, import, whatever wizard. That was the thing that was, you know, obviously I could have used it prior to this. But now I know that if we ever run into any other trouble, it'll be a million times easier to handle that. A revamped address book, a link previews. This is my favorite. When Oof. adding links to an email, this shows up real nice in there. Obviously, yep. when you yep. send it, it doesn't show up on the other end unless they have similar features. Right. But to you, you can see what you're sending. That way, less likely to send the wrong link. Uh, an easier first time setup. And with all this distro hopping we do, that's kind mm. of important to me because I like to just live on that distro, whatever that is. I'm right. just trying to live on it. So I need my mail. And we're talking, I mean, we're, we're spanning like five mailboxes. So I need a lot of yeah, mail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the first time setup, nice. Matrix. This is Matrix. This is new and big. Listen, if you do Matrix and you do mail, you kind of might want to check this out because it's Matrix built in to the mail client. So you yeah. have asynchronous conversations, email, and synchronous conversations, matrix, all baked into one. And the thing is, emails um, decentralized. Well, I don't know. Everybody's using Gmail these days. But if, you know, if you're not, mm-hmm. then email is decentralized and matrix is decentralized. It is a decentralized marriage made in tech heaven. It is. It's pretty it's, cool. It's amazing. And they added this tech, uh, this tech bar, this toolbar, off to the side on the left. And you know what it reminded me of? Vivaldi. No, that's cool. Because you got like contacts over there, you got mail over there, you got calendar over there. So like the the big main things, mm-hmm. matrix mm-hmm. shows up over there. Like the main things that you're swapping through are over there, and that's that's a pretty big departure from what Thunderbird was before. And For sure. some and some new icons. In 102, they started, so with those two last things, the toolbar over there and the new icons, they're really starting to give you just piecemeal what that new interface is going to look like in future versions. It's not here quite That's, yet. So don't don't go in there expecting geary well, setup. One, 102 is a big improvement in itself. It is huge. Though, so. And I have to assume that they're trying to stay closer to the Firefox version number because 102 yes. released and then 103 released like today, the day we're recording this. Yeah. And 103 is due Thunderbird soon. Right. So They do sort of keep track. I don't know if they're trying to keep track because they really are separate they entities are. at this point. Yeah, they, Mozilla they were, kind of... They, they, were, they were like this and then they went like this. And so they're they're kind of like, Side by side, so, yeah. um, it, it, so I don't know if they're trying to stay in tune with the same numbering scheme, but they've done well with it. So 
I from where I'm sitting, knowing nothing more, it kind of looks like it. Yeah, I said go with it. So I'll tell you about my use case for Thunderbird. In addition to the, the show, I also use it for most of my Lubuntu stuff. And here's why. I oftentimes have to send a GPG signed message or do it. or you know actually encrypt a message sometimes too. Thunderbird in the olden days, uh 90 something, I don't even remember when. Um you used to be able to have this extension that is called Enigmail and it did those things and it worked pretty good. However, fast forward to modern times, um, I don't really know when it became an integrated thing now because it's been around for a few iterations. Um, but the the GPG stuff is built in to Thunderbird. Nice. So you don't have to get the external extension anymore. And now it makes I, it very, very easy to pull in your GPG keys, um, you know, on your system. And... Actually, it makes it easy to manage them as well. Nice. So if you if you want to go that route, I know there are other tools that people use for that sort of stuff. But here's another use case that um, this allows you, if you don't have a key, you can create a key. You mm-hmm. can make sure it gets uploaded to the right places um, all through the, the mail client itself. And you, you can save to, the private bits. And and it's, it saves those on your machine. You don't have to use the command line, which is an alternative. That or, is huge. Or like some other tool like Seahorse uh, to to do these things. Um, well, I, I feel like that was a whole that was the whole reason why the why why that process Ubuntu's mm-hmm. process is changing because it's because so it used opaque. to be hard. Yeah, yeah, it used to be really hard. And uh, I don't know. I just like that it's built in there, and it they give you the easy button for that. Sure do. Sure do. And my use case is just multiple mailboxes. Well, do that too, yeah. And th- it does that pretty well, as well as Geary and everything else. I liked Geary a lot because you could integrate it in with GNOME and then Geary would just feed off of that. Right. But I think having a cross-platform mail app is more important to me now than it was any other time prior. Mm-hmm. Just because I have everything. I have all yep. the things floating around, and it's nice to have the same interface to deal with the same things everywhere you go. All right, uh, coming up on uh, next time, the history of Endeavor OS. It's a shorter one, but we're super excited for it. And then we'll give a few thoughts about how we get along with it. And, uh, you know, whatever else we can cram into the show. Yeah, it's it's easy mode arch. I love it. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I did get it installed. Um, I got a, it was a little bit of a late start for me, but uh, installation went good, so I can tell yep. you that. <laughs> Same here. Got it on a disc. It's all good to go. Uh, in between shows, catch us on Twitter, Mastodon, Telegram, Matrix, Discord, whatever. Uh, give us your suggestions on our subreddit, uh, our Linux user space, and join the conversation. Talk to us. Give us more ideas. All the links and show notes, and they'll be on linuxuserspace.show as well. So, Leo, where can we find you? I'm at Leo Travis on Twitter. And I'm at KC2BZ on Twitter. Join us in two weeks when uh, we return to the Linux user space. See you then. Is the next one the next history lesson on text editors? 
Is it going to be VI? Is it going to be Emacs? Do we start that war? Oh, well, I, I think we need to go VI because I feel like uh, Ed morphs into VI more than it does Emacs, but I could be wrong about that. I don't know. I don't know Emacs commands. I know VI commands. And Ed reminded me a lot yeah, I, I of know. VI. I, I think a lot of VI came from Ed. I guess more VI, I feel like, came from Ed than Emacs. So I feel like that's the next progression. And then we'll totally diverge and go off and do Emacs. Okay. And then we'll do G-Edit. And then we'll do... We'll yeah. do... <laughs> <laughs> we did... We probably should have specified that. I was kind of leaning more towards the command line stuff, but I guess So then we can talk about micro. We can talk the about things. Yeah, well nano, nano maybe. Nano. Nano's old. It's way older than I thought it would be. Um, um yeah. Oh, I, I'm I'm 100% on board with just doing CLI text editors. I'm happy with that. We could make a whole season of this nonsense. It goes pow. Pow.